allow me to introduce to you uh, the first keynote speaker of today, Professor Anne Rigney from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She is a Dutch scholar with Irish roots and strong bonds with Canada. She is, to put it mildly, a well-known expert in the field of memory studies and valued for a multidisciplinary approach combining literature, linguistics, and history. Her work is appreciated all over the world and got her an honorary doctorate at Aarhus University in Denmark. The research covers the entire 19th and 20th centuries as she investigates, amongst others, the transnationality of memorial culture in Europe and Canada from these three angles. She's a book prize winner, the author of four monographs and co-author of a respectable number of collections and articles, not only geared to the topic of this conference, but also to the work and impact of Sir Walter Scott, Ginny Deans, or Kurt Vonnegut's book Slaughterhouse, an impressive novel about the Dresden firestorm during World War II. In 2019, she received an ERC advanced grant for a project remembering activism, the cultural memory of protest in Europe, which is currently running at Utrecht University. Today, she will talk about the monumentality and its discontents, how the past is unforgotten. It is with great pleasure that I give the floor to Anne Rigney. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Hanno. Can everybody hear me? Good, thank you. Thank you for this uh, very kind introduction uh, and thank you for having me on this uh, occasion which promises to be a, a very exciting one. I'm going to share my, my screen uh, and hopefully this will work. So you can see it now in the... Um... Okay, can you see it? Yeah, fine. Okay, thank you. Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, let me begin at the beginning. I raised a monument more lasting than bronze. The famous comparison made by Horace between poetry and bronze implicitly acknowledged that monuments are the next best thing to the eternal. They are, above all, built to last. But unlike poetry, and this is, of course, Horace's point, they apparently don't last forever. Hence the paradox that will be central to our discussion today, the fact that while monuments are continuously being built in order to last, they don't last forever. This failure to last forever has been brought home to us, I think, in a very vivid way in the last couple of years in the context of Black Lives Matter protests that have seen the toppling of many colonial monuments across the world. But of course, there's nothing new about iconoclasm. As long as there have been monuments, there have been moves to destroy them. The long history of iconoclasm goes from the damnatio memoriae of the practices of the Roman period through to the monument bashing of the French Revolution to the wave of monument toppling in Eastern Europe after 1989, to the most recent wave of attacks on monuments just already mentioned, associated with colonialism and slavery. Destroying, dismantling and relocating public monuments is a structural feature of regime change as people adjust their memory scape to new conditions. And on the slide here, you can see some famous examples including the destruction of the George statue to George III when the United States declared its independence. You see everybody dancing around. It's, a, it's an occasion for a celebration. You see also the destruction of the statue to the national poet Adam Miskiewicz by the Nazis in 1940, and this statue was subsequently reassembled and put back. More recently, we have the toppling of Saddam Hussein in this very iconic photograph in 2003, and of course we have the this dynamiting of the Asia Torah, which we have seen many images of already this morning and which forms the background of our meeting today. When you put these images side by side, and, and there's many, many more of those, uh, where many more where they came from, you realize that breaking monuments may ultimately be as important as making them, and that they are periodically subject 
not only to physical attacks, but also to mu multiple revisions and even to physical makeovers. Take the case of the Van Damme column. Originally erected in 1806 to honor Napoleon's victory at Austerlitz, it was destroyed in a spectacular social drama in the final weeks of the Paris Commune. As is well known, the Paris Commune decreed the ceremonious destruction of the column because they saw its militarism, and I quote, as an attack on the principle of fraternity, as an, as an attack on the internationalism that was at the heart of the Commune. The demolition was carried out in May 1871. So even as the communards were fighting for their very survival, they took time out from the fight to bring down the hated column to the sound of music. And then they posed uh, for their picture, literally standing on the ruins of Napoleon. This is a highly dramatic and memorable moment, which has been uh, remembered in many uh, uh, circumstances. What's less well known, however, is the fact that this iconoclasm was part of a longer series of attempts to destroy or to reshape the column. When it was originally erected in um, 1806, it was an inspired, of course, by the Trajan column in Rome. It was topped by the figure of Napoleon dressed like a Roman. During the restoration after 1815, the figure of Napoleon was removed from the column, and which itself was left standing, though with a Bourbon flag at the top of it. After 1830, during the July monarchy, a new Napoleon was put on the column, but this time in modern dress. During the Second Empire, however, he was again replaced by another Napoleon, or perhaps it was a, the original Napoleon, because he was now back in wearing a Roman dress. In short, by the time the communards got to work, the column had already gone se gone, undergone several transformations, each of them linked to regime changes. And now did the transformation stop with the commune. Once the government of Thiers and the Third Republic had reasserted its control over Paris, it decreed that the entire column be restored, a bit like Humpty Dumpty to put them back together again. So by 1874, Napoleon was back in town. Although this new Vendôme column looked like the old one, its meaning, and that's important, its meaning could never be quite the same, since this new column of 1874 was erected dialectically as a response to the commune's destruction. Destruction restoration, revision, destruction, restoration. The changing presence of the Vendôme column reflects the ways in which our collective past is retrofitted, uh, is remade or retrofitted to match the needs of the present. Monuments can be seen as the visible markers of a complex dynamic by which collective memory is periodically remade by remembering some things and forgetting others. Now, in the second part of my talk, I want to briefly you know, move to the level of theory and, and to present to you a, a dynamic model of cultural memory, which will hopefully help us to understand better the role of monuments in these processes of remembering and forgetting. As this slide shows, uh, because we're moving to theory, we see the collective memory at its most basic in terms of the ongoing interplay or feedback loop between storytelling and identity formation. We share stories about the collective past and in doing so define common values, who and what do we find important, and we create a sense of continuity across time as well as a sense of solidarity in the present. These identities can be um, defined at, at various scales and within different frameworks, uh, the family, the city, the region, and so on. But I'm going to just concentrate today, above all, on the nation, since that's the framework we're talking about here. Um, and the national framework for memory, of course, was memorably defined by Ernest Renan already in 1882 as what he called a grand solidarity based on having a shared past and a common future. Now, I'll be coming back to this idea of a shared past later on, but first, I want to say a bit more about storytelling, which of course is my particular interest as a 
somebody who works in literary studies. Now, one of the guiding um, ideas in the current research into cultural or collective memory, whichever term you, you want to use, is that it is not produced by a single monument or by a single history book or by a single testimony um, or by a single commemorative act. It's, it's produced by the interplay between all these different carriers of memory, which resonate with each other, repeat each other to build up a, 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 a sense of a shared past. So when we talk about monuments, I think it's really important that we bear in mind the fact that we always have to consider them within this broader cultural field of storytelling. Nevertheless, and that's our uh, point today, I think it's also interesting to think what now makes a monument specific and what makes it different from a work of literature or a movie. And I just want to mention three features which seem to me important. The first one is, of course, that monuments tell stories, but they do so, they tell them in stone or bronze, they tell them in, in, in material form. And they do so um, by, um, uh, by choosing one form of another, just as there is a history of textual or literary forms, so too is there a history of memorial forms. Here you see an image of the um, Nelson's Column in Dublin, which was erected to the memory of the famous naval officer in 1806. And as you already see, it shares the same language of memorialization as the Vendôme column. And I think it's very ironic that both in Paris and in um, the uh, British Empire, they were putting up uh, the same sorts of monuments since at this time they were actually each other's sworn enemies. But we see this language. Uh, uh, so this is a language which is historically uh, determined. And nowadays, of course, we have a different, very different sorts of languages um, uh, for, for memorialization. Uh, here we see some examples of from the 20th uh, century memory scape, where we see a clear shift from celebration uh, to mourning, uh, as reflected in the downward movement of these monuments, as opposed to the upward movement of um, uh, earlier uh, monuments. And this, of course, is linked from a shift from figuration to a modernist uh, aesthetic. And I think lots of interesting things could be said also about the Azor Tor in this, in this regard as being about mourning, but as also being a very much an upward uh, movement. OK, uh, that's, I'm not, that's not my topic uh, today. But just to, to um, such as these are stories in, in stone. But, uh, but then I think we need to think about this idea, the materiality of monuments. They're not just, they don't just express, they don't have symbolic value, but they uh, also, and above all, have a material presence. They take up space and they're often centrally located in city centers where they force the traffic to go around them. And again, the Ace of Tours is its exception in this regard. Having access to public space, of course, reflects the fact that monuments are usually erected by the victors or by the empowered and not by the defeated. And linked to this, of course, they are very big, eh? often very, very big, as this monument to Stalin. And in their very materiality, they're designed to edify, to inspire, to generate awe and to display and uh, exercise power. Jane's Bennett's concept of vibrant matter, I think, is, is very interesting here in trying to understand the agency of, of materiality and, and, and link to this, therefore, the power of monuments to generate affects, including both enthusiasm and anger. And because of their strong physical uh, presence as a site for the exercise of power, they are also offering a physical site for acts of resistance uh, to that power. And they're offering a physical site for disagreements about the values ostensibly upheld in society at any given uh, moment. And hence, of course, then the, the, the idea of overthrowing them is also a way of shifting uh, the power of definition of the um, uh, collective past. All of this is linked to the um, to the, the th to the third, that should be the third point, not the uh, fourth point, to their anachronicity. Um, and what I mean by this is the fact that the, the, the very durability of monuments, eh? the fact that they have been built in order to, to become permanent, 
also ensures that they regularly outlive their moral sell-by date. They remain unchanged as the world around them undergoes political revolutions and cultural revolutions and demographic uh, changes, so that hitherto marginalized group may lay, uh, uh, and such changes which lead to hitherto marginalized group laying claim to representation in the public space. In such conditions, um, monuments actually change their meaning and become physical carriers of uh, values and identities that are no longer tolerable. At that point, their presence becomes toxic, an insult rather than a reason to celebrate. Precisely because monuments grow outdated, in other words, they help also to make visible the fault lines between old identities and alternative or emergent ones. They provide platforms for social dramas and, for, and they therefore act as catalysts in the process of mnemonic change. This, I think, is what makes them so very important. Now, this brings me back to the other half of my discussion, which is, oh, there is just an image of the Nelson's Pillar also blown up in 1966 by the Irish Republican Army because at, at the sense it had been outdated its tolerable, the, the, its um, presence in the city of Dublin. Okay, so let me go back then to the other side of this storytelling identity formation. Um, and I've already suggested there's a feedback loop between the storytelling and different car carriers and uh, identity formation. Um, memory in that sense, but also communities and solidarities is always work in progress. Over time, dominant narratives are contested and new identities emerge in tandem with new stories. In the, and I referred earlier to how the past can be retrofitted to become the prehistory of a changing present, attuned to the demands of newly emergent groups. And this retrofitting entails what I call unforgetting. Ernest Renan memorably linked the creation of a shared past both to the power to remember and the power to forget. And this was, of course, taken up by Benedict Anderson and Imagine Community, but I think the point is fundamentally made uh, by Renan, who famously remarked that the essence of a nation is that its members have many things in common, but also that they have forgotten many things. Every French citizen has to have forgotten the Saint Bartholomew and the 13th century massacres in the south of France. As this passage makes clear, memory or um, forgetting is not just a negative condition. Huh? It, it's what allows solidarities in the present to become possible by overlooking past events whose memory could be divisive. Of course, this is easier said than done. Ordering someone to forget, forget the San Bartholomew, forget the Commune, don't talk about the war, is itself, of course, a reminder. Moreover, as studies in transnational justice have shown, the instrumentalization of forgetting for the sake of reconciliation always carries the risks of imposing a false unity on the past and of erasing inequalities that from the perspective of the disempowered still need and should be uh, remembered. Now, given this importance of forgetting, it's not surprising that cultural memory studies has ended up spending a lot of energy in trying to understand the nature of forgetting and the interplay between memory and forgetting or between memory and counter memory. So by now, there's a huge literature. I just mentioned some um, titles here. But one of the problems is that each of these writers has come up with a different typology of forgetting. Uh, so I don't think yet we have a, a definitive vocabulary for talking about forgetting, and I'm not going to offer a definitive vocabulary, but rather just indicate some of the factors that may play into our understanding of um, uh, amnesia or forgetting. Um, and here I call on Paul Hikur's distinction between active and for passive forgetting, just to give you a, a basic typology. Um, active forgetting involves erasing uh, an alternative story, a story that has been acknowledged already in some way, which has been recognized, but is now going to be hidden from sight. It's going to be by being erased or by being occluded or overwritten. 
um, in the sense that something else is put in its place to distract the attention uh, from the earlier alternative story. And what has been called packs of silence are represent a variant on this sort of act of uh, forgetting. I'm thinking here of the act of oblivion after the English Civil War, but also the pact of uh, forgetting, which was linked to the uh, Spanish uh, transition after the end of the Franco regime. And in, in both cases, what you have is, is, a, is an agreement um, to, um, uh, to not talk about certain um, issues. So uh, in order to 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 have some form of peaceful coexistence but here again we have the problem about who determines what should what at what point we should stop talking um, and uh, we also see particularly in the case of Spain that uh, this sort of silencing very quickly leads to uncomfortable silence uh, and demands for unforgetting what has been repressed are included so these are never permanent conditions except in the case of the erasure of an archive, when there are no longer traces, uh, these are, most of these forms of forgetting are impermanent or temporary conditions. Once I mentioned so far, really active repressive uh, uh, ways of, of getting rid of an awkward story, uh, but there's also forms of passive forgetting, which I think are really important. Um, and this could be described as forgetting by default, since we kind of remember everything and everyone of course commemoration has to be selective eh? but every time you choose one thing you leave something else out you create a residue or a remainder the things not remembered eh? so for every act of remembrance you have the things not remembered they're not remembered because they're simply deemed not important enough eh? so it's a question of priority but more interestingly uh, there's some topics are simply overlooked they are they are literally invisible they are the unknown unknowns if you like uh, to recall donald rumsfeld we don't even know we have forgotten them um but this again too is not a permanent situation history shows that systems of relevance change in response to changing historical circumstances and the empowerment of new groups generates a, an awareness of what has been overlooked or passively forgotten. And things that were once overlooked become visible and acquire significance along again, of course, as, the, as long as the traces have not been erased. Of course, to give a simple example, feminism has generated an awareness of the stories that were occluded by default in the dominant culture of, of commemoration and has generated calls for these stories to be unforgotten. And of course, something similar is occurring now with the uh, decolonial approaches to public memory. In such cases, and that is important, unforgetting does not mean returning to a narrative that already exists, as it was a case of let's put Napoleon back on the column. Uh, instead, it means finding ways to give public expression to a story that has never yet uh, been told but that is perceived as being very important for uh, understanding the present. Now, of course, it's very difficult in practice to, to continuously distinguish between active and passive uh, forgetting and these sub varieties. But the important thing I want you to, to re retain here is the principle that remembering always generates a remainder, the story that has not yet been told, and that this remainder always has the potential to return at a later point in an act of unforgetting, return either peacefully uh, or through contestation. And this brings me to the final uh, part of my talk, where I just want to give you some examples to show this dialectic between remembering and unforgetting with specific reference to monuments. So the first example brings me back to the, I'm going to give you three examples. And the first one brings you back to um, the Vendôme column. From the, just to say from the perspective of what I've just been saying about active forgetting, we can say that the reconstruction of the column was a way of reactivating the memory of Napoleon, but also, and perhaps primarily, a way of repressively overwriting uh, other memories. On the one hand, the memory of Thiers' responsibility in the bloody repression of the Commune, and of course, the memory of the Commune itself and its, its aspirations, which, however, has, of course, lived on in other media, eh? so as this, such as this photograph. My second example comes from uh, Budapest, 
And I have to say, I thank this example to Andrea Petu, whom I was very pleased to see in the public. I had the pleasure of, together with a number of other memory scholars, of visiting Andrea in uh, Budapest, and she introduced us to this uh, fascinating uh, case. It is the memorial to the victims of the German occupation in Budapest, which was erected in the middle of the night in the summer of uh, 2014. The memorial, as you see, is a traditionally neoclassicist monumentalist in the neoclassicist monumentalist style, but with curiously grotesque uh, proportions. It's a very strange object. It features the statue, a statue of the Archangel Gabriel, a Hungarian national symbol, being attacked by a German inflected eagle representing the Nazi invasion and occupation of Hungary in March 1945. And the inscription at the base of the monument reads, in memory of the victims. Now, the monument has been widely interpreted as a form of whitewashing or a form of overwriting an uncomfortable history, as we've already seen in the case of the restoration of the Vendome column. It is, in this case, a form of whitewashing. It's, it's a remembering in order to forget a way of including all Hungarians into the category of victim and thereby also occluding or forgetting the complicity of the Hungarian authorities in the mass deportation of Jews and Roma. But, and this is the point of my example here, the monument has from the outset also elicited protests and demands to unforget Hungarian complicity, with people leaving objects and photos relating to the deportations, to the deportations and other related uh, um, events, uh, um, and placing them opposite uh, the monument in a sort of a standoff that has now lasted several years. And a student of mine recently sent me uh, a, a photo of this uh, extra addition to the protest, which refers again to uh, the victims. Uh, the, um, of the World War War, but also to the Corona victims as part of a criticism of the Orban uh, government. Um, so what I'm trying to suggest is that this monument, the contestation of that monument is providing a platform for uh, counter memories and even for connections to the present. And my final example brings me back to the beginning of this talk, uh, to the recent attacks on monuments in the from the colonial era. Now, in most public discussions of these iconoclastic events, the emphasis has been on the fate of the monuments that have now become intolerable. Should we destroy them entirely, are the more popular and I think wiser uh, option, relocate them to a museum where they become reduced to display objects, monumental has-beens rather than powerful forces in the public space. What has received less attention, but which in my view is, is even as important, is the fact that the discredited monuments are also providing platforms for the unforgetting of uncomfortable truths about past and present. And here you see how the memory of police violence against black people has been laid, literally laid over the face of King Leopold. This was uh, from uh, June, sorry, it should be June 2020. I'm, I'm running ahead of myself here. This should be June 2020. Um, uh, last year, in other words, uh, we see here how uh, Black Lives Matter protests are right, overwriting the statue of Leopold, just as in 2015, uh, the Black Lives Matter were overwriting, literally overwriting a monument to the Confederacy. And with that, I just want to make some brief uh, remarks and conclusion, which are really coming back to the points that I have made. The, 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 this point is that we have to think about unforgetting and remembering going together, right? Um, and secondly, that um, monuments, I think, play a dis have a distinct role to play in the dynamics of uh, unforgetting and remembering by offering a physical and tangible platform where people can meet and often uh, disagree with each other, but where identities are negotiated, albeit sometimes violently so. The vehemence with which monuments are attacked, I think, should be taken seriously as a power, a reflection of their power to offend, but also the great store that people set by their right to memory. Attacking monuments is not just aimed at reducing the power of dominant narratives, but it's also about making room for uh, alternatives. And this is already bringing me to the, uh, the last point, 
that the monuments offer a platform for dissent and debates about what the dominant narrative has left out and what should be remembered in the future. Being discontented with monuments is a key part of memory culture. Because of their materiality and locatedness, they can be particularly powerful vectors of debate and conduits not only for defining, but also for changing national identity. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for this very fascinating overview and, and paper. Thank you, Anne, for, for this very interesting topic in, in Irish history. Uh, I was just wondering if it makes sense to talk about the, the actors who dismantle the monuments, because sometimes those are called you know, patriots in terms of revolution. Sometimes they are official soldiers. Saddam Hussein was you know, by the US Army. So does that, is that important at all to compare who's dismantling um, those monuments? And what does that tell us about uh, remembering and unforgetting the past? Okay. Thank you for this great question. Hanno, do you want me to answer immediately or? Yeah, okay, thank you. Absolutely, right, this, uh, I realized I had so, there was far too much to be said on this topic. Um, we should think about who's taking down the monuments, but also who's putting them up. Um, just for the sake of brevity, uh, many of the examples that I gave were state-sponsored monuments, but of course, many of the monuments which are now being attacked to begin with the colonial monuments were put up by citizens um, uh, through subscription and crowdsourcing. So there's a whole history to be written about who puts up the monuments. Um, and conversely, then there's a question about who takes them down and, and the power of which is related to the, the, these sort of, uh, who has the power to put up the monument, eh? the financial power, but also the access to public space, but equally who has the power to take them down. Um, and I, I, I think there's a really another talk there on, on who does it. Um, and it's interesting to be to look at now the, in relation to the Confederate monuments in the United States, the number of, of different uh, sort of um, laws which have had to be passed in order to dismantle the monuments. So clearly the, the sort of the ad hoc spontaneous toppling of a monument in the midst of a protest such as happened in Bros Bristol in 2020 is, if you like, the extreme uh, case, right? Um, uh, the actual toppling in a violent act in the, in the revolutionary moment or in a would-be revolutionary moment. In other cases, they, they are often actually the powers that be are those in power who take them down. So I think one would have to, to see that in, uh, in more detail. But thank you for bringing this point up. I think it's really important. Excellent, thank you. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand. There's time for one question still, and then I can give you the floor. No one is answering or raising his hand. I have just a question to end. Um, I was a bit triggered by your remark on that monuments also point to a common future and some kind of pointing the way into the future. But at the same time, you say, well, they also symbolize um, values that are not longer tolerable and that monuments grow outdated. So how do you com combine these three different features in your view of monuments pointing to a future. Okay, um, thanks uh, for, uh, for this, and allows me to clarify. I didn't mean that monuments pointed to the future. Um, I, I meant that part of the idea of an ide a national identity link has an implicit notion of sticking together for the f in, in the future, right? Um, nevertheless, some monuments you could say are uh, aspirational, right? And in, in that sense, um, the, the expression of values are as much an expression of the values which are already existing and which are already common values as an expression of the aspiration to make something common values. Um, uh, so I, I think there's always this temporal element to them, but that's what makes, I think, monuments also so interesting to look at the temporality of them in terms of their, their aspirational function, uh, but in, in also in relation to the what we, uh, but that's particularly for the monumentalist style, particularly of the 19th century style. Uh, when we look at more recent memorials, I think we don't have an aspirational function in the same way. So I think there's been a change there. Nevertheless, these, so the monuments are, if you like, um, 
expressing values and, ex and, 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 and exercising a power to impose those values on the, on, on the society at large. And it's always been a question of trying to impose those values or finding agreement with those values. The question then is when that agreement breaks down or when, when the level of tolerance breaks down are, and that's of course linked to the degree to which um, certain groups and perspectives are finding their voice within the public arena. I mean, as to sit, for a monument to stay standing does not mean that it is support, it's the values it aspires to are actually being supported by the society. And, but, but gradually these, the difference becomes so great that we begin to get these iconoclastic moments. And if I may, I'd like to respond to Roland's uh, question about uh, I, that I look at museums as places where you keep objects. Again, that was a very short version of uh, an account of museums. Of course, museums do much more than just simply um, provide a storage space for, for objects. Um, they do much more than that, but they display objects. And what the distinction I wanted to make was a distinction between an object which is exercising power, which is claiming the right to shape people's opinion uh, in the city space, and an object which in Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet's idea of a display object has become uh, a dis an object to be reflected on within the state of, within the context of a museum, where of course it relates to all sorts of other objects and to all sorts of activities. So I, I wasn't in any way saying that museums are just a dumping ground uh, for statues, but I'm, I'm glad to have a chance to uh, clarify that point. Okay, thank you very much, Anne.